talk, um, we can get started. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the One World Combinatorics Onwards uh, seminar. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Jeff Shallot from the University of Waterloo. He's going to speak to us about new results in additive number theory via combinatorics onwards. Okay, thanks. Um, so uh, Nared has said the title, and this is uh, in part joint work with Jean-Paul Alouche, who's in the audience here, and Jason Bell. Um, first, before I get started, I just want to say a couple of things. One is uh, thanks to my spectacularly competent and excellent uh, co-organizers of this seminar, who every two weeks do such a good job bringing to you um, these talks. So uh, Manon and Anna and, and Narad deserve a lot of thanks. Um, the second is that uh, this talk is mostly for people who are interested in combinatorics on words, but I know that there are also a, a couple of people who are interested in additive number theory in the audience. And I want to say that uh, to both groups that I will be saying some elementary things about both topics, and therefore you will be bored respectively in different areas of the talk, but uh, I, I apologize for that and hope you can stand it anyway. All right, so um, uh, what's additive number theory? Uh, well, the study of the additive properties of integers. And uh, one feature of it is that you can have very simple to state questions that can be very hard to resolve. And one of the most famous ones probably everybody knows about is Goldbach's conjecture. There it is in this letter to Euler in 1742. It says every even number greater than or equal to four is the sum of two primes. And um, if you want to know why it's true, well, the reason why it is likely to be true is the existence of this asymptotic formula that tells you the number of representations of n as the sum of two primes. So this formula is, is much less well-known, but well-known to additive number theorists. It says that the number of representations, G2 of n, is basically n divided by log n squared times some factor which depends on the prime factorization of n. Um, and that's for n even. And here, this pi 2 is just a, a constant, it's sometimes called the twin prime constant. So if you want to know why it's true that, that every even number is the sum of two prime, the main reason is because there's tons and tons of representations, at least conjecturally. Um, and we can even predict how many with pretty good accuracy. Okay, so if you're given a set then of natural numbers, uh, what is it that additive number theorists are interested in? Well, first of all, which numbers are representable? as sums of elements of that set. And secondly, the number of such representations. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the number of representations, not merely whether numbers are representable or not. And there are three main functions, which you have to memorize the notation for to understand the rest of the talk. The first is R, K, A, N. So A is a subset. Um, and this is counting the number of k tuples with elements chosen from that subset A, such that n is a sum of those k numbers. So the number of k tuples of A that sum to n, that's R k A n. And then you can put various restrictions on the sum n's. You can say that they're strictly increasing, in which case I put a little less than subscript. Or you can say they're increasing, but not necessarily strictly, in which case I put a little less than or equal to sign. So that's the notation that I ask you to memorize. K is the number of sum ands, A is the set, and N is the number you're trying to represent. So you're counting in each set, in each of these three, uh, the number of different representations. So these were originally studied by Erdes and Turan and their co-authors starting uh, about 80 years ago. Okay, so why study these R? You might ask, well, what's the point? Why would you want to study them? Well, the reason why is because they have a nice interpretation 
uh, in terms of power series. So if we're given a set A uh, of natural numbers, we can define its characteristic sequence A of N to be one if a number is in A and zero otherwise. And then we can also de define its associated power series, which is the sum of this indeterminates x raised to the nth power, and you include that x to the n if and only if a of n is equal to one, which is if and only if n is in a. So that's two natural th ways to think of the set a. One is a sequence, uh, a characteristic sequence of zeros and ones, and the other is this power series. So what is the R K A N? It's just the coefficient of X to the N when you raise A of X to the Kth power. So you take that formal power series, you raise it to the Kth power, and then you're just going to get the, the number of ways to represent N as a sum of elements of, uh, of, of the set A. So for example, let's take the Goldbach representations, uh, the, the ways to represent uh, numbers as the sum of two primes. So if we take A to be the prime numbers, then the power series is just X to the two, X to the three, X to the five, X to the seven, and so forth. And then Goldbach conjecture says that if you look at the coefficient of X to the two N in the square of this power series, well, it's always positive for N greater than or equal to four. And it says two here, but it should be four. Okay, so that's the motivation really for studying these R's is trying to understand um, both number representations and also what the powers of power series look like. So additive number theory, you have tons of these simple statements that can be hard to prove, but the opposite is also true. You sometimes have in the literature long complicated proofs that were superseded by very simple arguments. So let me just give a, a couple of examples. So here's one of the results of Erdős and Turan, and it says, suppose A is an infinite subset of the natural numbers. Then if we look at this R2AN, which just to remind you, it's the number of ways to represent N as the sum of two elements of A, cannot be eventually constant. So the original proof of Erdős and Turan used some big theorem, the Fabry gap, gap theorem, but uh, G.A. Dirac, who incidentally was a, a stepson of Paul Dirac, the physicist, and also a nephew of the physicist Eugene Wigner, he says, oh, wait, this has a trivial proof, because if n is even, and more precisely, twice an element of a, then the number of representations of n as elements of a must be odd, because you get one from two copies of ai, that's one representation, and then you, for all the other ones, the sum ends are different. So the order matters. So you, they, they are in pairs. So that means that it must, the number of representations has to be odd. Where is if N is odd, then the number of representations has to be even because you always get these matching pairs. So there's a one line proof of this, of this theorem. Um, Another one, another example is this result of Erich, Sarkozy, and Shosh from 1985. They proved that if R2AN is eventually increasing, then the complement has to be finite. And their proof was very complicated, eight pages and a lot of case analysis. But Balas Abramanian found a much simpler one page proof in 1987. So there can be hard statements that are, uh, there can be statements that are, initially have complicated proofs that actually are pretty easy, and there can be easy statements or simple statements that are very, very hard to prove in this area. So what's my goal in the talk? My goal in the talk is to convince you that tools from automata theory and combinatorics on words can be used to prove interesting non-trivial theorems in additive number theory in relatively simple ways. And so this gives the additive number theorist new tools to attack problems with and gives in our uh, area the specialist in combinatorics on words new applications for theorems and new justification for why it might be interesting to study these things okay so let's start with a, a result of lambeck and moser so there are their their photographs on the right so uh, let e be the set of evil numbers what are the set of evil numbers 
they're the numbers where the number of one bits in the binary representation is even, and let the script O be the odious numbers. This is the number of one bits being odd. So for example, 11 in base two is 1011, so it has three one bits, so it's in O. And 10 is 1010, it has two one bits, so it's in E. And um, about 60 years ago, Lambeck and Moser proved the following theorem. Namely, if we count the number of representations of N as a sum of two elements of these sets, but here we're counting them uh, where we demand that the, uh, the, the sum Ns be arranged in increasing order. Uh, so we, 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 we don't uh, allow reversal of the sum Ns and count that as different. And we also throw away sum Ns that are the same. Then the, they're the set. They're the, 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 these R functions are the same for these two sets. So, for example, let's look at nine. Nine. If you look at the evil numbers, you can see you can write nine as nine plus zero, or, or zero comma nine, and you can write it as three plus six. And those are the only two ways. And for for the the odious numbers, it's one plus eight and two plus seven. So the number of representations is the same. And this theorem was later proved by Dombey and Lev and, and other people. Okay, so we're, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna prove this using techniques from combinatorics on words. Um, and um, to do so, I have to make you, uh, take you on a little detour and talk about linear representations. So a linear representation for a sequence, f of n is a triple, v, gamma, and w, where v is a row vector, let's say uh, with t entries. Gamma is a matrix valued morphism. In other words, for each letter in some alphabet, it assigns a matrix to that letter, a t by t matrix. And w is a column vector with t elements. And then how do you compute f of n with this thing? You first write x as the base b representation of n for some agreed upon base, like base two. And then you form the dot product of v with gamma of x and w. And by gamma of x, I just, because it's a morphism, I mean, you multiply all the gammas applied to the individual letters, making up the string x. So you take x, you write it in base b, you find the corresponding matrices for the digits, you multiply those matrices together, and then you pre and post multiply by V and W. And that is F of N. So that's what I call a linear representation for F. And this T is the rank of the representation. Okay, so just as an example, let's look at a linear representation for the Stern sequence. The Stern sequence is a famous sequence from, uh, from combinatorics on words. And uh, it's defined to be A of 2N is A of N, and A of 2N plus 1 is A of N plus A N plus 1, with initial values 0 and 1. And so here is a linear representation for it. Here's the V, here's the gamma, here's the W. And if we want the 27th element of the Stern sequence, we write 27 in base 2 as 11011. And then we multiply the vector V times gamma of one, gamma of one, gamma zero, gamma one, gamma one, and then W, and we get eight. And that's the value of the Stern sequence as you can check. So <clears throat> uh, that's, that's what a linear representation is. Okay, and now I have to remind you what an automatic set is. So a set is B automatic if there's a finite automaton that recognizes exactly the set of base B representations of members of A. And for example, those remember those odious numbers, they are the numbers where the number of one bits is odd. And here's an automaton that recognizes the odious numbers. Um, if you want to, to, to put in something like um, 11, then you start here at this state, you read, you follow the arrows corresponding to the bits of 11 in base two, which are one, one, O, oh, one. And then you get to a, a state with a, a double circle and the double circle means accept. So this one accepts the set of odious numbers. 
Okay, so now there's a theorem, and the theorem is more or less due to uh, Bouchy and Briere, but other people were involved too, but I, I consider these two as the the, the real uh, uh, inventors of this theorem, and Bouchy in the 60s and Véronique Briere later on, um, and uh, clarifying and, and correcting the original claim of Bouchy. Um, so let A be an automatic set. So there's an automaton recognizing the representations of the set of members of the set A in base B. Then this R K A N or less than or less than or equal to these three variations, they have linear representations. And not only do they have linear representations, but we can compute those linear representations with an algorithm explicitly from the automaton for A. And the proof is by these results of Bouchy and Briere, you just need to write down a first order logical formula for this R K A N. Um, and uh, but these logical formula is just the, the definition, right? It's the uh, N is is represented as uh, some there exist variables, uh, let's say T1, T2, T3, such that N is equal to T1 plus T2 plus T3. So so there's a logical formula and 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 that's all we have to say. So it's pretty easy once you have this big result. Okay, so now, now you can see the plan of my proof of the Lambeck and Moser result. The plan of the proof is, is just find the linear representation for the R less than sums, and then somehow show that these linear representations compute the same function. So now we have the second step then. We have to say, well, given two different linear representations, how do I decide that they are uh, that they compute the same function? So the way I can do this is the following very simple idea. Namely, uh, if we have a linear representation for F and a linear representation for G, then we can form a linear representation for the linear combination of F and G, say al alpha F plus beta G, by using block matrices. So here, we, if you multiply these things together, you can see that what you get is uh, the alpha F and beta G. Okay, well, so then if we had linear representations for these two different functions, we could form a linear representation for their difference. Then what? Well, there's a nice algorithm due to Schutzenberger, which you can read about in the a book of um, Berstel and Ruttenauer, um, for finding uh, uh, an equivalent linear representation with minimum possible rank. So putting this all together, we get the theorem that if you have a linear representation for F and a linear representation for G, it's decidable if F of N is equal to G of N for all N, you just find the linear representation for their difference and you minimize it. And what happens if it's the zero function, you get a linear representation of rank zero. Um, and so that you can easily compute and check. Okay, so going back to Lambeck and Moser then, to prove it, we just need to find a linear representation for both sides, use that theorem. And we can do that with this software package called Walnut, which is written by Hamun Musavi, who you're probably, you probably heard about before, um, and maybe it's tiresome, but it's very easy to say that uh, the number of representations of n as evil numbers is the 2a Morse uh, uh, function evaluated at i is zero, the 2a Morse at j is zero, i is less than j, and n is i plus j. And for odious, it's t of i is one, t of j is one, i less than j, and n is i plus j. And these gives us two linear representations, they turn out to be of rank eight. Uh, then we uh, then we we combine them using this uh, block matrix approach, and uh, then we minimize and we get the zero, uh, the, 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 the linear representation of rank zero for zero. Actually, in this case, it's even easier because it turns out 
these two linear representations of rank eight that we compute with walnut turn out to be exactly the same linear representation. So we don't even have to do what I said. We just get it right away. Okay, so there, a proof of an existing result from the literature on additive number theory, just using these ideas from automata theory and combinatorics on words. Well, let's try to prove something slightly novel. Not, it's not a big theorem at all. It's just, just to show that you can apply the same techniques. How about R instead of R less than? So what's the, how, how does R2 for the evil numbers compared to R2 for the odious numbers? And it turns out that they're almost always very close to, they are always very close to each other. Namely, they're either zero or they're plus or minus one. So uh, the difference between R2E and R2 zero, R2O is uh, Iverson notation and even times minus one to the TN where T is the two amorphous sequence. And we can prove this using exactly the same technique as before, finding the linear representation of both sides and showing that they're the same. Okay, let's go on to another result. Chen and Wang proved uh, another similar kind of result, but now for the function r less than or equal to. So remember, that's the number of representations where one sum and is less than or equal to the other. So for that, he used two different sets, namely uh, the analog of the evil and odious numbers where now we consider the parity of the number of zero bits instead of one bits. So for example, 10 in base two is one zero one zero. It has two zeros in it. So it belongs to E prime. So what did they prove? They proved that R less than or equal to of these two sets are the same for N greater than or equal to one. So notice for N equals zero, it's not the, not the case. Um, let me think about that. Why? Why n greater than or equal to one? Uh, hmm. Oh, less than or equal to. So zero plus zero is zero, right? So there would be one representation for O prime and none from E prime. Okay, and this was also later proved by Lev. Um, all right, so how do we prove that? Exactly the same as before. We shift the indices so that we have a statement for all n greater than or equal to zero instead of just n greater than or equal to one. What we want to prove is this for n greater than or equal to zero. And then we can do it exactly as before. Here, TT is this uh, uh, so-called twisted two-way Morse sequence where we're counting zeros instead of ones. And these give us two linear representations, this time of rank 20. We combine them to get a linear representation for the difference, which is of rank 40. We minimize it and we get the zero uh, representation. Okay, so um, so far we are more or less retracing the steps that other people have done. Let's try to go and uh, go where no one has gone before, and let's let's look at the Rudin Shapiro set. So, what's the Rudin Shapiro set? Um, this is the set of integers where the number of one ones in the binary expansion of n is odd. So for example, 15 is 1111. And if we think of the number of one ones in there counting overlaps, there are three of them and that's odd. So it's it's in R. So R for Rudin Shapiro here. So Dombey proved that for k greater than or equal to five, the function R k R n is an eventually increasing function of n. And he also conjectured that this is true for k equal four, but nobody has a proof of this yet. It seems likely to be true based on empirical calculations, but no proof is known. Well, in Dombey's paper, he said that uh, R3RN is not eventually increasing, but he didn't give a proof of it. So how could we prove it using these techniques? Well, R is, a, is an automatic sequence fairly easy to see. So we can get linear representations for R3, Rn. And then talking about whether it's uh, it eventually increasing or not, that means we need to look at the first differences of these. So D of N is defined to be 
the first difference of R3RN. And uh, uh, this first difference, uh, what we need to see is that this is, let's say, sometimes negative. And then it would be that R3RN is not eventually increasing. So we can do that with our walnut code. We can say Rudin Shapiro uh, is one uh, for I and for J and for K and N is equal I plus J plus K. And then we can do it for N minus one. And then we do the block matrix trick. And now we need to find infinitely many N such that D of N is less than zero. So how can we do that? Well, in general, uh, a... Uh, uh, given a linear representation, understanding exactly how it behaves is, is hard because it, it brings up all sorts of things like uh, the, the joint spectral radius. Um, but for certain subsequences of N, we can often get an exact description and understand it in detail. And the subsequences that are very easy to understand are the ones that correspond to powers of matrices. And the powers of matrices correspond to N with a certain representation in base B, namely repeated blocks. So if your N has a base B representation that looks like X followed by I copies of some block Y, not just a single digit, but a block followed by Z, then we can understand it pretty easily using linear algebra. So that's because the linear representation is just going to be controlled by the powers of the matrix of gamma of y. Now, what do we know about the entries of gamma of y to the ith power? We know that this can be expressed as a linear combination of the ith powers of the zeros of the minimal polynomial for that matrix. But a fact from linear algebra. So we can then solve for the coefficients of this linear combination. We can, uh, using the first few values of f, which we can compute directly, let's say just by whatever the, the function is or from the linear representation. And then we can get an exact closed form formula for f. So for the Rudin Shapiro set, let's pick ends that look like this t plus one copies of one zero in base two, or in other words, two to the two t plus three minus two over three. So now what do we need to do? We need to understand the minimal polynomial of gamma of one zero. So this is some matrix. It, it actually turns out to be a pretty big matrix in this case. Um, I don't remember the exact dimension, but several hundred by several hundred. Now, once we have the matrix, though, we just go to a symbolic algebra system like Maple or Mathematica. But since I'm at Waterloo, it's Maple. And we find its minimal polynomial. And here it is. There's the minimal polynomial. And these are irreducible factors. So right away, you see that uh, the behavior is going to be somewhat subtle, right? Because there's a, a, a cubic and a quartic involved. So there's some constants. A, B, C, alpha, gamma, beta, delta, and so forth, such that this difference, D of Z, T, is A plus B times 2 to the T, there's the 2, plus C times 4 to the T, there's the 4, plus a linear combination of the roots of, um, of, uh, of this cubic with one real root and two, imag two complex roots. And then a linear combination of the four complex roots of this quartic. Okay, so it's it's somewhat complicated behavior. All right. Well, um, yeah, I could see there's a typo there, which I need to correct. Sorry. All right. So let's go and find what these look like. Well, the zeros of the cubic, there's one real root. It's about 2.75 and two complex roots with magnitude 2.4. For the quartic, there are two pairs of complex number roots, and the, the, the largest ones have magnitude 4.88. So that means that this, this uh, D of ZT is, uh, ZI is going to be completely controlled by these zeros of the quartic. 
And then we can solve for the coefficients, the, 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 the constant coefficients out in front, and we get this beta one and beta two. So putting that all together then, this value of d of zt is gonna be dominated by the real part of this number beta one times delta one to the t. And uh, it turns out that this beta one is not, uh, uh, if you divide by its magnitude, you don't get a root of unity. And so basically you get, uh, as t varies, you get a, a dense, uh, it covers the, the circle mod two pi in a dense way. And in particular, then, whenever the argument lies between 3 pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4 for this beta 1, delta 1 to the t, then you're going to get something that's negative. And so d of zt, then, is less than 0 infinitely often. And so we've proven that uh, r3rn is not eventually increasing. So we get a fairly non-trivial statement where we can precisely point to exactly where this R3, uh, Rn, it fails to be um, uh, it, strictly increasing. It, it is actually decreasing at those points. Um, and uh, with more work, we could even estimate how much it decreases. Um, okay, so this shows that this, uh, this, this combinatorics on words approach is not uh, a panacea in the sense that you instantly get the answer. You, you have to use some other tools, but that's fine. It's just another tool to use. Okay, let's go on now and talk about uh, the 2A Morse power series, which is a natural one to look at. It's the one corresponding to the odious numbers. Um, and uh, my colleague Jean-Paul Alouche recently proved using complex analysis and following ideas in Dombey's paper that the coefficient of the 10th power of t are eventually increasing. Um, and more precisely, what he proved is the following. Suppose you have a sequence of plus or minus ones, and you form a formal power series out of them, and uh, you, you let a be the set of uh, integers such that uh, this these q n minus ones are, are equal to plus one instead of minus one, then provided this q n z is less than or equal to c n to the alpha for some alpha for all uh, z on the unit circle, then this r k a n is eventually strictly increasing if k is big enough. And how big does k have to be? It has to be two over one minus alpha. So, from existing results on the 2a Morse sequence, we know that alpha is about 0.79. So since 10 is bigger than 2 over 1 minus alpha, then we get the result for the 10th power of the 2a Morse power series. On the other hand, we can prove, just like we did for Rudin Shapiro, that the coefficients of t to the fifth are not eventually increasing. So here we have up to the fifth power, we have fluctuations. At the 10th power, we no longer have fluctuations and, and the, this R function increases uh, strictly uh, at some point forward. And the status of the inter intermediate powers, T to the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, still unknown. It seems likely to us that t to the 6 has eventually increasing coefficients, and I'll say something more about that at the very end. But we don't know how to prove that. So there's still work to be done. Okay, so now what I want to do is talk about how we can use these ideas to both discover and prove a new result. Um, uh, to uh, refute a conjecture in the additive number theory literature that was, uh, as far as I know, open for something like 20 years. So Dombey, in his paper in the early 2000s, he studied the properties of this R3an. In particular, he studied the first difference of this sequence. So just to remind you, if you've tuned out, uh, R3an is the, the number of representations of n as a sum of three elements of A. Okay, so 
If the complement of A is sparse, or in other words, A itself is dense, then what do we expect R3AN to look like? Well, you have three choices for the sum ends. So you pick the first one. And because A is dense, you expect roughly something like N choices. Then for the second sum end, you expect something like N choices. And then the third sum end is fixed because they have to sum to N. So that gives you something like order N squared choices. So you expect R3AN to be roughly like N squared. So then when you take the first difference of something that grows like N squared, you expect it to be roughly like N. So you expect the first difference to be grow roughly like order N. But of course, there could be fluctuations. So let's see what these fluctuations might look like. So I did this for A to be the complement of the set of squares. So here's R3AN minus R3AN minus one, the first difference of R3AN. And you can see, yeah, it looks like it's growing roughly linearly, right? Maybe something like, oh, I don't know, 0.8N. But you can see that there are fluctuations. So it's not, it does not appear to be strictly increasing eventually at all. And the fluctuations get bigger and bigger in this little graph, which suggests that it, it's never going to be eventually increasing. Okay, so Dombey conjectured in 2002 that there in fact is no set A such that the complement is infinite and R3AN is eventually increasing. So you should think of N as kind of dense here. There's no set A such that this is true. But in fact, there, there are such sets. In fact, there are uh, infinitely many such sets and they're not hard to construct. So here's the theorem. Let F be the powers of two multiplied by three. So three, six, 12, 24. Let A be the complement of this set. Then R3AN, not only is it eventually increasing, it's eventually strictly increasing. And not only eventually, it's strictly increasing right from the start. Okay. So how, how, how can you prove this? Exactly the same idea as before. You generate a linear representation for the difference, R3AN minus R3AN minus one. Then by looking at it, you can guess a closed form for this difference. And then you can verify the closed form with Walnut. And the closed form is strong enough to show that D of N is always positive. So what is the closed form? Just to tell you what it looks like. It looks like the following. Uh, D of 3N plus I is 3N minus three times the ceiling of log 2N minus some little remainder term, which is bounded by a constant. In fact, this remainder term is itself an automatic sequence. So you can guess the automatic sequence then and then verify it with Walnut. And so this is enough to show that this, this D grows almost exactly like N minus three log N. And once you get N far enough, big enough, then it will obviously be positive. And then you can just check the small values with an explicit computation. Okay, so how did I find that example? I actually found that example um, using ideas from combinatorics on words. Namely, I did a breadth first search on the tree of all possible finite zero one sequences. And then I rejected a sequence if R3AN wasn't strictly increasing right from the start. So I guessed that not only would there be an eventually strictly increasing counterexample, but it would be strictly increasing right from the start. So then you just do a breadth first search, you prune the tree. Um, then of course, you want to be able to understand what the sequence is. So how do you do that? Well, I guessed that it might be automatic. So then what do you do? Well, then you use the myhill the road theorem or a version of it to find the smallest finite automaton that's compatible with the number of terms you have guessed so far. And I said, you know, okay, I'm gonna throw it away if the automaton is too complicated, if it has more than uh, eight states. 
So then I just let it run. And after a little while, I was left with some possible counterexample sequences generated by finite automata with a small number of states. And then I just looked at that one and said, oh yeah, I can see that that it's it's probably eventually, it's probably uh, strictly increasing right from the start. And then um, you can guess the closed form and then you can prove it with walnut. Okay, so now you might object that this example is not so nice because the set is very sparse. So a natural kind of question that would occur to any additive number theorist is, is there an example where this F has positive density? So the, the F is the counter example set, that is the, the complement set. And the answer is yes. Uh, if you let F be the set of natural numbers whose base two expansion is of even length and begins with one one, then this F is of positive lower density and the R3 uh, for the complement of F is strictly increasing. So it, it, we can even find examples then that, that have positive uh, lower density. Doesn't have to be sparse like, like this F here. And once again, you can prove everything very simply with, with automata and with, with uh, the linear representations. So uh, I feel like this is uh, kind of proof of concept that this tool might actually be useful for additive number theory in some cases. Okay, now uh, I was sharing these ideas with multiple people, including my colleague, Jason Bell at Waterloo, and he proved the following theorem, um, namely that provided this, uh, this counter example set is not too quickly growing, then uh, this eventually strictly increasing property will hold. And so there's a whole family of examples that refute Dombey's conjecture. It says, um, suppose you have a, a set F, suppose you have its characteristic sequence, um, suppose you define a uh, uh, the sum of the first N plus one terms as sigma of F, uh, suppose this sigma of F is not too big, it's big O of N to the alpha for some alpha, which is bounded by K minus two over K, where K is the number of some ands, uh, then this RKAN is eventually strictly increasing. So this is much more general than the specific example that I gave because it applies to a wide range of different Ks. And the idea is, is nice and simple. Um, it's that uh, we can say, all right, we have this, uh, this this power series for F. And then if we look at the complement set of F, this corresponds to one over one minus X minus F. And then the kth power corresponds to the RK. And to get the first difference, you multiply by one minus X. Okay, well, now you can expand that expression using the binomial theorem, and you can estimate the size of the coefficients, and that gives you the result. And that's the idea in the proof. Okay, so um, I should mention that uh, after we proved this, then other mathematicians looked at this, and very recently our uh, condition of alpha less than or equal to k minus two over k was improved by uh, Shandor Kish, uh, Shabbos Shandor and Quan Hui Wang to alpha uh, less than or equal to K minus two over K minus one, and that's optimal. And I believe um, uh, that um, uh, Professor Kish is uh, here in the audience. Okay, um, now I'll do maybe one or two more examples and then that'll be it for today. Um, let's look at an example involving the Fibonacci word. So combinatorics on words, people know this word very well. It is the, the word that is defined to be the fixed point of the map, zero goes to zero, one, one goes to zero. And now we can look at the positions of the ones in this set and call it script F. And we get one, four, six, nine, 12. This is a variation on something sometimes called the upper uh, Vitoff sequence. 
And uh, another way to express F is by Fibonacci representations. Namely, we can write N as the sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. Um, and then when is N in F? It's if and only if, <coughs> pardon me, the low order coefficient of this representation is equal to one. Okay, so here's what I can prove. Uh, just as an example of the technique, really, it's not a deep result, is that if we look at the number of representations of N as the sum of two elements of F, it uh, it has a, a, a blip where it's, where it's equal at specific N, and the same thing for its complement set. And where do these N and these, the, these blips that are like this occur infinitely often? So once again, we can do this just by computing some linear representations. And we want to show that the linear representation number of representations of R2FN is equal to R2FN minus one and is equal to this, this number in terms of Fibonacci numbers whenever N is this particular expression in terms of Fibonacci numbers. So how do we do that? We do it using the same idea from linear algebra as before. Namely, um, we can find an explicit closed form for uh, the number of representations at these particular values of n. And then we can find, uh, we can simplify the expressions for the, the two sides and show that they're the same. Similarly, we can, we can do the same thing for uh, uh, some... Uh, some uh, for the complement set uh, n minus f. Okay. Um, finally, here's one where we use three sum ands. Here it's a little bit more complicated because um, uh, you know it grows more rapidly. So we can show that there are places where the the three sums of these this set uh, has this blip where it it stays the same at two consecutive indices, and now we have more complicated minimal polynomial. Okay, so I mentioned that there are some conjectures here that nobody knows how to do currently. And here are the three ones that nobody knows how to do. For the Rudin-Shapiro set R, then uh, R4Rn is greater than R4Rn minus one, if N is big enough, so it's eventually strictly increasing. For the odious numbers, the uh, six power, as I mentioned, is eventually strictly increasing for n greater than or equal to six. And for the evil numbers, the sixth power is also eventually strictly increasing, this time for n greater than or equal to 38. So, um, you know, the, these are things which I do not see how to prove using this uh, combinatorics on word slash automata kind of ideas. Um, maybe it can be done, but I don't know how. Um, or maybe I throw it out as a challenge to to additive number theorists to to try to resolve these these three conjectures. So, to summarize, automata and combinatorics on words can be used to prove new theorems about additive number theory. In some cases, sometimes you can prove the theorems more or less purely mechanically just by doing some computation. Although I didn't say so, sometimes the computations require a lot of space and time. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with matrices, uh, several hundred or even thousand by thousand, then, uh, you know, it, it could be that it takes a while to compute some minimal polynomials. Um, and if you're getting up to 10,000 by 10,000, it might take a real lot of time. Um, but uh, the downside is the techniques that I presented can't really be used, um, at least directly, for more traditional sequences like the ones that, 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 that additive number theorists love so much, like primes and squares. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in further reading here, some of the papers that talk about the things that I talked about today. So thanks so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Jeff? Oh, I'm just going to have a question. So sorry. Hi. So, uh, uh, so from the question, 
uh, conjecture is about R3. So what happens if you consider R2? Yeah, so R2 uh, cannot be um, eventually strictly increasing. I think uh, that, that was one of the theorems that I mentioned early on, ah, um, unless the set is finite. Ah, so and then what happens if we, we consider R greater than or so instead of R, R itself? R yeah, so a good question. Uh, so it's relatively easy to show um, that uh, uh, if uh, if R three is eventually strictly increasing, then R k will be eventually strictly increasing for all k greater than or equal to three. Okay. So so or, or more generally, once it starts being eventually strictly increasing at at some k sum ends, all higher sum ends will be eventually strictly increasing. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Paul. Yeah, uh, Jeff, there are uh, two theorems in, in which, uh, I mean, who, which involve uh, some alpha and some K and there is an inequality and this is the same inequality. You convinced me that it was not the same thing, though the uh, inequality between alpha and K is the same in both theorems. And it happens that as you have just said that the, for the second theorem, uh, there is an improvement, which is optimal. Do you know whether for the first theorem such a such an improvement is is believable? I, I don't know that, um, but uh, maybe Professor Kish knows and will tell us. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Sorry, I haven't thought about this yet. I haven't heard about this. Okay. Because in him say Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Hi, um, I, uh, I've been using Walnut for a little bit and it might not be related to this talk, but I hope I can squeeze this question. Uh, 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 so I, I've been reading your book, uh, Logical Approach, and thank you for the book. Um, I was wondering if I, if I could be directed to um, making, a, making a custom uh, num base number system using like um, uh, substitution on zeros and ones. Uh, is there a, is there a simpler uh, simpler uh, solution than case based analysis? So for the for making uh, additive automaton addition automaton. Uh, yeah. So I so if I understand the question correctly, I'm not positive I did. Uh, you, you want to make your own uh, numeration system for use with Walnut based on some uh, substitution rule. Um, yeah. And and so um, you you know we, we don't know any general way that is that will do this in all cases. Um, what we do have is the theorems of Frunyi, Christiane Frunyi, and her co-authors. That tell us, um, you know, uh, for uh, uh, the so-called piezo enumeration systems, uh, this can be done, and she even gives an algorithm that will provide the adder that is needed, the thing that will uh, normalize or add uh, representations uh, in those systems. So, um, uh, for, for those systems, it is more or less straightforward to do it yourself. Um, okay. For other kinds of things, nobody really knows. Um, okay, so if you choose, uh, for example, a uh, substitution that like zero to zero one one and one to zero, which looks a little bit like Fibonacci, but then uh, you will have to do your own case analysis for the additional compound, am I, am I right? Well, you'll have to uh, figure out whether it's a piezo numeration system, um, which you can look at by the lengths of the iterated morphism and looking okay. at the, and seeing if that is uh, if the the the, the zeros satisfy the piezo requirement, and if so, then you can use Christian's method to to do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and don't don't hesitate to contact me offline if you need more assistance. Yeah, uh, I have emailed, but uh, my supervisor mentioned, uh, and this is fair that you you you're a busy man, so I 
I didn't I expect don't, an audience. I don't think I got your email, so maybe send it again. I will try again. Oh, thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, thanks again, Jeff. For your okay, talk. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming today. And um, our next talk is uh, two weeks from now. Uh, we'll have uh, Bastian Espinoza. Um, until then, um, yeah.